night on Nation to Nation. As one blockade goes down, another goes up. But it seems one thing always comes out on top. When you pit jobs, the, the promise of jobs against Indigenous rights and environmental rights, then and, you know, typically it's, it's you know, who wins over, it's, it's jobs, jobs, jobs. Justin Trudeau was too slow to react to the crisis, chasing a UN Security Council seat instead of negotiating. We've managed to come a far away with a very good international reputation, but can we really be a world leader when things have gone so wrong at home? And finally, Canada knows the path to reconciliation, but Alex Neves says the hardest part is being overlooked. We have politicians who say the right thing all the time, uh, but we're still stuck uh, in terms of the tough decisions, the real action and follow through that is so crucial. Hello, I'm Todd Lameron and welcome to Nation to Nation. Trains are once again running through eastern Ontario, but not without arrests and court injunctions. In fact, it seems getting the courts to grant injunctions is almost as easy as ordering a pizza. Over a dozen have been given across the country to end protests or blockades. Then, news broke that Wasowatin hereditary chiefs made a tentative deal with the federal government. Details are still unknown and still need to be ratified by the people. But we know the pipeline construction is set to resume. To discuss all this is Carolyn O'Neill. She's a journalist for Ottawa's Indigenous radio station, Element FM. And Pissio Lag Pfeiffer, owner of Inuit Solutions. Welcome to Nation to Nation. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Pitsy Lack, I'll begin with you. Uh, what do you make of these court injunctions? Should it be that this easy for companies to get them? Well, what it does is uh, allow uh, legal mechanisms to, to take place that uh, will give some certainty uh, for, for companies to continue their work, backed by the force of the state. And, uh, you know, with that, it, it, uh, it allows for, for public discourse to, to really say, okay, something's happening, and that's kind of what uh, Canadians are looking for. It should be this one-sided, though, it seems. It's uh, completely one-sided. What it does is uh, put all of, the, uh, all of the blame and guilt on Indigenous peoples that are trying to protect their lands, and, uh, and it just perpetuates, uh, you know, this war, perception of war between Indigenous rights and, and Canadian economic benefit. And so that's, that's just kind of how it's unfolding and perpetuating. Uh, I guess, uh, could you even say that uh, the rights of companies like CN Rail seem to matter more at this point? Well, it seems to ma seems to matter more to who. I mean, uh, you know, the economic engine of this country is 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 vital to the success of, of economic growth and jobs. That's really the the the, the trope that's been playing uh, for for weeks now. Uh, it eb ebbs and flows in terms of uh, what decade we're talking about. But really, uh, you know, when we're talking about railways. It it seems as it's it's part of the critical infrastructure that that. That word is key because we remember during Harper, his uh, his 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 bill about uh, protecting critical infrastructure, really was to work directed towards Indigenous peoples. Uh, Carolyn, uh, what's the political atmosphere in Ottawa been like? I mean, how, how do you see Justin Trudeau and his government how they've handled this situation? You know, I don't think they've handled it well. I think the first mistake was that Justin Trudeau spent as long as he did trying to secure that seat on the UN Security Council, and I think that was a big mistake. I think that regardless of how somebody may see the issue, I think it's fair to say that we are really a nation in crisis right now. And when your nation is in crisis, you need to come back and start to work to resolve it and start to meet with people. And I think there's an irony in many ways to go and try to get a seat on the council like that when we, we've we managed to come a far away with a very good international reputation, but can we really be a world leader when things have gone so wrong at home? Would you th say that it was polls that uh, forced his hand at one point? Because uh, he really kind of flip-flopped on what he wanted to do. He wanted was preaching patience. Then about a week ago, uh, he wanted uh, police forces to enforce the rule of law, as he said. Absolutely. And I think part of that does go back to that political atmosphere that you asked about. I think every single day he probably feels that pressure of a minority government and what that means for him. And I do think that the polls impacted the way that action changed. And I mean, even if you look at that most recent marketing poll from Leger, right, they say that the majority of Canadians are dissatisfied with how Justin Trudeau has been handling himself when it does come to solidarity action. Uh, of course, and we've heard a lot of blowback, of course, uh, towards uh, Indigenous people. Um, I mean, it's obviously very unfair. Um, but I mean, what can you do? I mean, 
what's the, what's the way out? Well, you know, lots of different forms of solidarity action lead to the rights that people experience today, right? Those have been perhaps unpopular moves at the time, but those are the things that do bring us forward. And I have heard, I've spoken with lots of youth and they're saying that that's why they continue to do this. I was covering the sit-in at the Justice Ministry building and they said, you know, we have unions because of solidarity action. If you look at the different rights that people have or that people continue to strive towards, that is because of the solidarity action. And it's like action that we have been seeing happening across the country. So I think that especially the youth I've spoken with are resilient and they are facing some very severe blowback. And I think people don't necessarily appreciate the degree to which people are experiencing this, especially in terms of social media, but that doesn't seem to deter people from standing for what they believe is right. Uh, Pitsy Lack, I noticed you were nodding your head, so uh, get your take on this. Well, I think what uh, what's really lacking here, and I think everyone understands this, is that the, this Trudeau government is really lacking a lot of leadership. And I'm seeing uh, fractures within uh, within his cabinet. If we look at the uh, if we look at the public safety minister, uh, you could you could almost tell that uh, uh, he's he's talking about uh, you know uh, let's be patient. But I can almost see a begrudging tone to to kind of his public statements. There are uh, people within his ranks, within his, his cabinet, within his party, uh, that believe it's it's you know, it's time to stop all of this nonsense with 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 the blockades and bring in the police and and restore order. And that's uh, that's really putting Trudeau in, in a corner. And uh, you know, it's 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 setting back. Uh, you know, some of the it's taking away some of the the positive the positive uh, feelings towards reconciliation in this country. And of course, it plays into the conservative playbook right now, at least coming from Andrew Scheer. Uh, not only Andrew Scheer, but uh, Albertans, uh, the Alberta, Alberta government. We're looking at the, the conservative leadership hopefuls uh, buying in and perpetuating that, that divide and conquer uh, uh, tactic, that political tactic. It's been effective for years. And, and when you pit jobs, the, the promise of jobs against indigenous rights and environmental rights, then, then you know, typically it's it's you know, who wins over, it's, it's jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, and you talked about what it's about, it's about rights and uh, Indigenous rights. Uh, do you think the media has made that clear or is it still some confusion out there on what's being presented to Canadians? Well, I, I've been reading constantly uh, about some of the takes on uh, different uh, media outlets. Um, there still is a very prevalent uh, polarity between left and right leaning uh, conservative uh, conservative takes on uh, some of the media outlets in this country uh, that are just perpetuating and feeding that fire of, of you know, borderline racism. It's really unfortunate, uh, but it's, it's, it's a tactic really to divide Canadians and in the hopes that uh, public sentiment will shift away from uh, environmentalism or even Indigenous issues over land and rights. Uh, Carolyn, uh, I guess uh, uh, on that same theme, uh, is the media giving a full picture or is it just a, to some media outlets it's just an anti-pipeline protest? You know, I've been thinking about this a lot, especially how this does come down to the future of reconciliation as well. And in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action, the media is given calls, right? And I would say that in regards to this particular story and how we've been covering a lot of things, I don't think we've met those calls to action. I don't think that on the whole there has been a fulsome picture of what this comes down to. You know, I haven't seen very many reference to Elgamuk, for instance, and where this comes from. And this is something that I think different people have been calling the media out on for the better part of a year. Like this time last year, people were saying, you know, it isn't, it isn't just about a pipeline, it's about more than that. And I don't necessarily think that the media on the whole has taken that year to get to know what the more than that is. Uh, Pitsy Olak, I'm going to give you the last word today. Um, have, do you remember a time, because uh, you're a bit long in the tooth like I am, <laughs> yeah. uh, where there's ever been this much power for Indigenous people to shut down the country and push through their rec uh, recognition of their rights? Well, when it happened before, in particular, uh, Grassy Narrows, we're talking about Oka, you know, the 90s, uh, it, was, it was a different time in terms of public sentiment towards Indigenous peoples, Indigenous rights. Uh, now we have the benefit, uh, unfortunate benefit or advantage around the issues of climate change. 
and uh, you know the work that uh, that's been done since since the 90s by global youth there's two generations of global youth now that are are pushing more uh, around the, the agenda of, uh, of climate climate change and and concerns over the environment you know so it's keep, that marriage that's really um, pushed really forward. it is it is that catalyst and, and it's and it's almost doubling the forces who are more uh, sentimental or actually in a, in a better moral position. Well, again, uh, I always thank you when you drop by and give me your, your thoughts on these issues. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. After a short break, longtime Secretary General for Amnesty International, Alex Neve, drops by. Welcome back. Alex Neve has been Secretary General of the Canadian branch of Amnesty International for 20 years, but in January, he announced he was stepping down. Amnesty has brought attention to many human rights struggles Indigenous people have had to endure, whether it's the decades-long land claim of the Lubicon Cree, the government's underfunding of First Nations child welfare, or the high risk of violence Indigenous women face. Joining me to talk about the past 20 years is Alex Neve. Welcome to Nation and Nation. It's great to be here. Thank you. Now, I mentioned a couple of things in there, and uh, quite often you were ahead of some of these issues before mainstream media or even the government. And, for example, violence against women. You've been talking about that for well over 10 years. Uh, how did these issues make it onto your radar right from the start? Uh, well, absolutely. First and foremost, it has always been from people who are at the heart of those struggles. Uh, so with respect, you, you talked about First Nations children. It was very early collaboration with Cindy Blackstock. Uh, with respect to violence uh, against Indigenous women and girls, uh, it was the incredibly courageous and persistent women, uh, people like Bev Jacobs, uh, who right across the country for years uh, had been urging uh, Indigenous organizations, but certainly uh, the Canadian government and police services, etc., to pay attention to what they said was a human rights crisis and were constantly rebuffed. Uh, so we really followed their lead. Uh, so that's always been uh, where it begins for us. We, we certainly don't um, uh, in any way suggest that we're the ones who know best. Um, once, once we have formed that kind of partnership, we obviously bring Amnesty's experience and our global reach, uh, but we need to hear from communities and the front lines uh, as to what the key issues are. Is that a philosophy of Amnesty in, in general, or was that something you brought personally when you took over that 20 years ago? Uh, I would say it's both, uh, and I would say that it uh, that it's reflective of Amnesty's approach to human rights work right around the world. Uh, probably 30 or 40 years ago, it wouldn't have been so much uh, that you know Amnesty. I think even uh, like a lot of organizations and activists within the human rights movement, uh, was perhaps a little bit top down uh, and and didn't have as much of a commitment to making sure that we were truly connected with with activists uh, at the front lines. Uh, but, uh, but certainly for me personally, uh, and I think in particular, as we started to embrace a wide program of work regarding the rights of indigenous peoples within our own country, those relationships, those partnerships, that solidarity, uh, that, that was just a given. It, there was no other way for us to do this work. In that 20 years, have you seen the, the needle move at all when it comes from government or even the media or the general Canadian public? Uh, recognizing these issues as human rights issues. I think uh, I think there has actually been huge progress, and uh, I mean here we are in 2020, and obviously we have a very worrying situations right across the country the last uh, the last few weeks with respect to how things have played out in Wet'suwet'en territory and all of the solidarity protests, etc. I think leaves us in a in a rather concerned and distressed state. But I think if we do go back and think about the 20 years, so for instance, 20 years ago, um, the UN was still deadlocked in going nowhere negotiations with respect to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Twenty years ago, uh, that of course has been embraced by the United Nations and, and we're on the cusp, we hope, in the next few months of finally starting to see it uh, become part of the legislative framework of Canada. Uh, the issue of violence against Indigenous women and girls you know, 20 years ago wasn't on the radar screen at all. If, if any politician had been asked, they would probably have honestly had to say they'd never heard of the issue or they would have dismissed it as, you know, well, crime happens, let the police do their job. 
we've of course now had a major uh, national inquiry. I think the key thing for me though is 20 years later, we have had the national inquiry, we do have a UN declaration, we did have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We've got a lot of um, great material out there, uh, and a comprehensive set of recommendations. We have politicians who say the right thing all the time, uh, but we're still stuck uh, in terms of the tough decisions, the real action and follow through that is so crucial. So it sounds like it's uh, things have changed, but uh, there's still quite a bit to do. Uh, uh, I suppose if we look at it specifically at the Trudeau government, it's like you said, it said all the right things. That nothing's more important to him than a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Um, but um, how would it rank really when it comes to human rights issues? Uh, well, I think, uh, as I say, w what, what we often don't see is the follow-through. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of high-level uh, progress that's been made, um, and, and I don't want to dismiss that as insignificant. Obviously, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls was hugely consequential. Uh, the fact that the government is very committed to bringing the UN Declaration into Canadian uh, laws is, is very, very important. But then we look at um, the decisions that are being made. I'll, I'll use one that that Amnesty has been working on in conjunction with First Nations uh, for a number of years now, the Site C Dam in northeastern British Columbia. Uh, it, the, the fact that both the, the federal government here and the, the NDP government now in BC, which has similarly embraced the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, are nonetheless steaming forward with construction of a dam that flies in the face of what the UN Declaration is all about. The two most affected First Nations, uh, Prophet River and West Moberly, have both made it very clear that the destruction of their traditional territories that will come with this dam is unacceptable and they are opposed. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, billions and billions of dollars are invested and that charge is ahead. You know, it, it really kind of gives lie uh, to the fact that great things are said but when tough and important decisions need to be made, then that conviction seems to fade away. Uh, and you've mentioned, of course, the UNDRIP a couple of times. Uh, BC, of course, adopted a, a bill, uh, 41, I believe it was. And the uh, Justice Minister David Lametti has promised that before the end of this year, a federally uh, government-sponsored bill will drop. But uh, when it's all said and done, does it make any difference uh, if they adopt it? and uh, five years from now we're still in this position we find ourselves in today. Uh, well, clearly, if five years from now we still find ourselves in the same position, it won't have made any difference. And I think is what is incumbent, not just on our political leaders, but in fact on all of us as Canadians, is to make sure that first and foremost, yes, the next step of bringing the UN Declaration into Canadian law happens, but then that we convey the strong expectation uh, to our leaders. And I'm not just talking about federally. This includes provincially. We only have the BC government government that has taken that formal step so far. The other nine provinces and three territories should all similarly implement the UN Declaration. But then it's incumbent upon all of us to make it clear that we have certain expectations of our governments uh, such that it's not just going to be fancy words uh, in, in legislation, but is actually going to become, as Senator Murray Sinclair has often said, the framework for reconciliation in this country. Uh, but that means, going back to something like the Site C Dam or the pipeline debates that keep coming up, that means we have to be ready to make the tough decisions. We need to, to finally recognize that there's a whole legacy coming out of the decades and decades of colonialism in this country uh, that means that we have to change uh, and that we're going to have to show some compromise and sacrifice in doing so. Uh, of course, uh, look back at your career, uh, and we've mentioned a few things uh, during our discussion, but is there any one thing that you can kind of point to and say, uh, yeah, this kind of worked out. We, uh, it looks like uh, we were a success in pushing this particular human rights issue. Uh, well, I think in many respects I would, I, even though it's not a finished story, I, I would point uh, to the work that we've been so involved in with respect to violence against Indigenous women and girls. Uh, uh, I, I use that because first and foremost I'll admit that I am very proud uh, that Amnesty International back in 2004, um, working closely with, with uh, two amazing Indigenous uh, women researchers, uh, Bev Jacobs and Giselle Lavallee, um, produced our, our 
report, Stolen Sisters, uh, which I think was really the first offering uh, from a non-Indigenous perspective, uh, making it clear how severe this crisis was. Uh, and I think what we saw uh, unfold after that, it, it's been a long journey, obviously, 2004 to 2020, and we're still not done. Um, but the ways in which amazing uh, Indigenous women leaders uh, right across the country, nationally and at grassroots, incredibly courageous families coming forward to share their stories, um, have, uh, have then propelled that story, that narrative, that challenge uh, to be the true national um, uh, imperative that it has become, uh, I think, is an incredibly important human rights story. Well, you're to tell. on the job uh, till June, um, but I want to thank you for taking some time before you left uh, to speak to me. Thank you. Uh, well, and let me say thank you right back. Uh, you know the the opportunities we've had uh, to explore important uh, issues with respect to the rights of Indigenous peoples in Canada uh, with a whole host of APTN colleagues has always been one of the high points of my work. Okay, that sounds great, thank you. After the break, the James Bay Cree Health Board says it's ready to spring into action if the coronavirus shows up. Welcome back. The James Bay Cree Health Board says it's ready for the coronavirus. It looks after the health needs of nine Cree communities in northern Quebec and is ready to spring into action with an emergency plan. Although there are only two confirmed cases in Quebec and three dozen across Canada, I spoke to two representatives of the Cree Health Board earlier who insist they're ready with an evolving plan. Where we actually focus mainly on identification of cases and isolation of them to prevent transmission to the population. So that's, that's what I mean as is it, it's an evolving plan. Despite the low number of infections, there is still some concern. It's a little concern, especially for the ones that uh, travel for medical appointments with specialists down in Montreal. And they're always kind of worried because it's an international airport. So we give them uh, recommendations what to do and uh, make sure they wash their hands and not to touch uh, everywhere because the airport is a uh, big traffic. So they're kind of sometimes worried when they line up to go get uh, through the security and all that. They have been using community radio and podcasts in Cree and English, stressing that the level of risk in the region is still very low. And from what we hear uh, from our colleagues and people that are very close to the field is that we've managed to, to send that message of reassurance that we are ready, but people don't have to worry so much at this point in time. Dr. Riche again says they're as prepared as can be but that the general public is key to minimizing any spread of the COVID-19 virus. But it's a collective responsibility that people also have to take uh, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette very seriously in this time, because in the end, that may be the measure that is most important in all this to prevent transmission in the region. That's our show for this week. If you missed any part of it or a previous episode, check out our podcasts. Go to aptnnews.ca slash podcast. I'm Todd Lamoran. Thanks for watching.